Hello, everyone, and welcome in to CrushTheStreet.com. I'm Kenneth Amaduri, and I'm joined today with a returning guest, someone who has spent the, the last 40 years focusing on helping people uh, make decisions with their money. He's been featured on all the major news networks. He's a guru in the financial space. He's the Money Answers Man, host of the Money Answers radio show. Jordan Goodman, thanks for coming back on Crush the Street. Looking forward to exploring the markets with you and some of the action steps that you have. Great to be with you back again, Ken. I got a good response from your first time. I'd love to be back and help your folks again. Awesome, awesome. Well, uh, I was watching Lloyd Blankfein, CEO of Goldman Sachs today, and he was even talking about how he's approaching the markets from sort of a defensive strategy. You know, we got uh, earnings which are doing well right now. I mean, they're doing great, you know, largely maybe because of the tax cuts for whatever reason. But there's a lot of new normal that uh, the economy is dealing with, ultra low interest rates, uh, central banks purchasing uh, risky assets. And the unwinding of that, you know, we're not really certain on how that's going to play out. And, uh, you know, that's lowered the volatility risk in the market, you know, by central banks purchasing these assets. And anyway, even a guy like the CEO of Goldman Sachs is saying how he's cautiously optimistic and unsure about how things will play out going forward. So I'd love to get your initial thoughts on the markets and, of course, how this plays into your financial advice that you give people. Well, there's kind of binary choices going on right now, Kenneth, as to what could happen. I could give you a very optimistic scenario and a very pessimistic scenario. The optimistic scenario, particularly re regarding trade, which I think is really a, a key factor in the market's kind of day-to-day -day, uh, action, uh, an optimistic scenario would be uh, Xi, the head of China, who just made himself emperor for life, basically said, I want to have more trade, not less. I do not want to have a trade war. Let's concede to the Americans. We won't steal their technology and their intellectual property. We'll close down all these aluminum and steel factories that are overproducing. Uh, we're going to lower our tariffs and really have, that would be the most bullish thing you could imagine, to have an opening of trade um, and have China kind of cooperating with us. And, and that would be a fantastic thing. And it's, it's possible. He can do it. He doesn't need any re-election. He doesn't have to worry about the midterms. He can do whatever he wants. <laughs> and he, he gave a speech about a week ago saying that China's open for business. We want to have more trade. So, you know, that's the optimistic scenario, which would be hugely bullish for the markets. Because the big cloud over the markets right now is, are we going to have a trade war and how bad is it going to get? So that's the optimistic. I guess I'd say that's with my rose-colored glasses on. <laughs> now let me take the rose-colored glasses off and say, Chinese have been, we've been pounding on them for years, not only us, but around the world and World Trade Organization. And they're not changing their behavior, basically. They, they're going to continue to steal our technology and overproduce and do they they have a big 20 trillion dollar project called the one belt one road initiative which is they're investing literally trillions of dollars in like 70 countries basically to take over the world when it comes down to it and they're not going to bend at all i've actually been to china and a big part of their psychology um is uh saving face as they call it they don't like to be look like they're uh, backing down or losing respect or anything like that, if they're saving face, Trump's policy is in your face. <laughs> okay, So mm -hmm. it's not a good combination. And it could very well be that we have an outright trade war. I mean, look, this started with Trump wanting to do tariffs on steel and aluminum. And then China said, OK, we'll raise you $3 billion in tariffs on 128 of your products. And Trump said, OK, well, I'll, I'll do $50 billion in t tariffs. And China said, OK, we'll do $50 billion. And then Trump came back and said, we'll do $100 billion. This is like a, a, a casino game where they're raising you all the time. Well, this is real lives people are involved in here. And China said, we don't want a trade war, but if you want to go that way, we're not afraid of it. Um, so that, this is the big binary, binary choice affecting the markets right now. So if you have the optimistic scenario, they back off the cliff, we get more trade, wildly bullish. If we have a real trade war and neither side backs down, wildly bearish okay they did the last time we had a major trade war was 1930 and you had the smoot hawley tariff act 
which was tariffs on 10,000 products around the world. All these other countries then retaliated against us, and trade dropped 60% in a year. And it caused a depression, basically. So, I mean, Trump put out a tweet saying, trade wars are easy to win, and we're going to win. Nobody's ever won a trade war that I can see. So hopefully we don't go that direction. But to me, that's the big binary choice affecting the markets right now. So markets are climbing the wall of worry. And it's kind of an interesting thing because I feel like people are more optimistic now, especially with the economy, at Dow Jones, you know, near all-time high, S&P near all-time high than we were when Dow Jones was uh, 12,000 and that was end of America, right? So uh, right. it's kind of one of these, you know, arithmetically, $12,000 Dow Jones is, you know, 100% more attractive than uh, twenty four, twenty five thousand dollar Dow Jones. So, I mean, how do you how do you approach these markets, and in, in, you know, with your strategies? Well, I think I go for growth. That's what it comes down to. I go for the companies that are going to do well, even if we do get into a trade war. I mean, Netflix is not going to be hurt by it, or Salesforce dot com, or uh, Google, which has no operations in China. There's lots of places you can go that are not going to be that much impacted by a trade war. Um, so that's and, and then there's a fund. I'll give you a, a fund that invests in the 200 fastest growing companies in the world, which is called the Exponential Technologies Fund, symbol XT. And they do in every industry, biotechnology, robotics, 3D printing, cloud computing, driverless cars, you name it. Every industry, they have the top companies that are growing exponentially. Um, that stock, that was, it's an ETF, came public at about $20 a share, I think, in 2015. Now it's about 36 37 So that, to me, is a way to play growth around the world without you having to be an expert in it directly. So that, that's my strategy, is to go for where I think the growth is going to be. Sure. Yeah, you know, and one of the things we were talking about prior to this, you know, talking about Bitcoin, talking about the markets... Uh, markets have a way of washing and rinsing the investor. Even in bull markets, you know, they have a way of shaking out uh, investors from even experiencing the ride up. And bear markets have a way of, of shaking people out and getting people to sell at the bottom. And I guess, you know, just to uh, your thoughts on that, you know, what is a good way to approach markets that are that can be volatile. You know, how do you how do you do that? What do you what advice do you give people? One of the books I did is called Master Your Money Type, and I talk about people's financial personalities, um, and you have to kind of understand your personality in order to withstand the normal emotional feeling is when things are going down, I want to sell, and when things are going up, you want to buy. You know, it may be psychologically easy to do that way, but you don't make a lot of money that way, buying high and selling low. But that's what a lot of people do. They, they take what happened in the past and say so that's what's happening now. Everybody's kind of on edge. When's the next 2008 meltdown going to happen? And so they've missed a lot of this rally. I mean, we basically had a nine-year rally, you know, a few little corrections here and there. But basically, we've been going up for about nine years. That's one of the longest bull markets in history. So, you know, it, it's not going to last forever. <laughs> and uh, basically, it's going up now because earnings have been very strong. Uh, the tax reform is just starting to kick in. Deregulation is being very positive. So on the fundamentals of what's happening in the economy right now, it's very positive and it really supports a higher stock market. The, the negative side are these kind of extraneous factors. And there's three. I mean, we talked about a trade war with China. The second one would be a, a war with North Korea. Now, again, Trump is going to meet Kim sometime soon. Either they could hug each other and have world peace and North Korea would do nuclearize and they head right to Sweden to pick up their Nobel Peace Prizes or it blows up and then we start you know, threatening each other again and saying how big my button is compared to your button so that could go either way and the other one's the Middle East you've got this, you know, we bombed them recently in Syria and Russia and Iran and Israel this whole very complex stew could easily get out of control. So those are my three kind of extraneous factors that I worry about. Middle East war, North Korean war, and trade war with China. If none of those three things happen and we're, we're to the fundamentals of the economy, I think the market's going to go much higher. 
What about the new normal of uh, monetization of debt, ultra low interest rates, and the sustainability of that within the U.S.? Is that a, of a concern for you, or is this new normal something that can go on for an indefinite period of time? I think it can go on for an indefinite period of time. We're, we're at roughly $21 trillion in the national debt. That's on the books. If you look off the books, you're talking about 50 or $100 trillion, you know, unfunded pension liabilities and all kinds of other things. Um, but we have the capacity to handle it. The tax cut helped private businesses and individuals a lot, but clearly means the government's going to collect a lot less in revenue, and therefore is going to have a huge amount of treasury offerings this year, well over a trillion dollars in new debt, um, because they're bringing in less revenue. And meanwhile, they had a huge amount of increased spending. The budget bill they ended up passing was $300 billion more on defense, on rebuilding Puerto Rico, on all kinds of things. So the deficits are going to be much, much higher, well over a trillion dollars as far as the eye can see every year. Um, at the moment, we're able to handle it. Long term, it's not great. I mean, what if we get up to $30 trillion in debt, something like that? Uh, that would That's putting a, a burden on the government because you have to, right now it's about $300 billion in interest every year. You get those numbers up and you're going to squeeze out other programs because they got to pay interest on the national debt. So, it, I mean, the market's risen nine straight years while the debt's been going up. And the deficits went from, well, when Obama took over, it was about $10 trillion, and now we're $21 trillion. So just because the debt's gone up doesn't mean the stock market can't go up at the same time. Mm. Well, I guess just a, a realization of the, insus, the sustainability of the debt, because at this point, it's just ongoing. And what you're saying is that the economy at this point can handle it. And right. I, I know a lot of people are worried about if that statement is true, especially if we have interest rates going up. And the implications... That's going to cost a lot more. Just by having interest rates go up means the deficit is going to go up because we're paying a huge amount on treasury bills. We've been lucky to be able to pay zero on treasury bills for a long time. Now, as that goes up, as the Fed raises rates, Say rates on treasury bills go from zero to one. <laughs> Doesn't sound like that's like a hundred billion dollars right there on on twenty one trillion in debt. So interest rates going up is going to cost the government more and therefore increase the deficit in itself. Jordan, uh, I want to get into one of your action plans here, and Good. it's something you talked about in our last interview, and I we got a lot of feedback from that, and you know I had people asking me about this and. You know, I told them, you know, go to the website and, and check it out. Um, and I know you'll mention that here, but, um, you know, you're talking about paying your mortgage years sooner than, uh, you know, most people would imagine to in a way that is, it makes a whole lot of sense. Uh, it's just, you know, it, it doesn't cost much more and, and you have uh, money to put towards investing. It's like a win, win, win all around. So if you would, please explain sure. this to us and, uh, you know, how this works. So this is a strategy called mortgage equity optimization. And you're right. Literally, it allows you to pay off a 30-year mortgage in roughly five to seven years on your existing level of income. You don't need more income. It's the way you flow your money that allows you to pay your mortgage off literally 25 years faster than you ever thought possible. And Ken, you will never hear about this from a bank. Okay, Banks are totally uninterested in helping you pay your mortgage off faster. They love the current system, which is you keep your money in a checking account earning zero, and you pay them interest for 30 years. Even better, refinance your mortgage and start a new 30-year clock five or 10 years into it. Right. So the current system works real well for the banks. This is turning the tables so your money is actually working for you instead of the bank. So I'm going to do a very brief explainer of how this works. So the traditional system is you keep your money in the bank, checking account earning zero, you pay interest, the same pr uh, payment for 30 years on a mortgage. The early years, 10, 15 years, pretty much all interest, very, very little principal paid down over the first 10 to 15 years. So what you, instead of that system, you use a home equity line of credit, it's called the HELOC, which is a liquid line against your house, which you can take money in, take it out, write checks, completely liquid anytime you like which is at the prime rate or a little bit more than the prime rate. So four and a half, five percent, something in that range. Okay. You keep your income, which is normally sitting in your checking account, in the HELOC. Again, it's completely liquid. You put money in there, which pushes down your balance in the HELOC, or what's called average daily balance. The bank looks and says, how much do you owe? 
You owed fifty thousand yesterday. We just put a check in for a thousand, so you now owe forty nine thousand. So you're paying interest on forty nine thousand because you owe less principal. Right? And then you write checks and you pay your bills out of that HELOC, which makes your balance go back up again. If you have positive cash flow during the month, more money coming in than going out, you're making progress on your principal every day. So literally every month, you pay your principal down at an accelerating rate, and uh, in whatever, five, seven, seven years, you're completely paid off. Let me just do a simple example, Ken, of how this might work. To help yeah, no, that, that would be, and then if you could start at, um, you know, with what someone would buy the house for and, and what you put down on it, I think that sure. would be helpful. So let's let's buy a house for three hundred thousand, and uh, do a two hundred thousand dollar mortgage, okay, something like that. All right, so you've got a hundred thousand in, in equity. You would then, and your your first mortgage, the two hundred thousand first, is a good mortgage, four percent. You got some got a good good rate on it, but it's thirty years. All right, you would then open a HELOC. Home equity line of credit for say fifty thousand on that. So you now owe what you you have two hundred fifty. You would then write a check on that HELOC for fifty thousand to the first. So now you've transferred fifty thousand in debt from the first to the HELOC. Okay. So your first now instead of being two hundred is down to one hundred and fifty, and you owe fifty on your HELOC. Right. You're with me. Right. Right. right? Okay. Now you use this technique we just talked about, where you keep your income in the HELOC every day, you're pushing your balance down, and you'll pay that 50000 off in nine years, nine months, a year, whatever it comes out to be. So say a year later, you pay the 50000 off, okay? So now you do it again. You write another $50,000 check on your HELOC, which is now free and clear, towards your first, where you owed 150. Now you owe 100 on your first. You take another year to pay the HELOC off, so now you're back to zero again. You do it twice more, you go to 50000 and then you go pay off your first, and then you pay off your HELOC, and in five, six years, you are completely mortgage-free. That's unbelievable. And and just to be <laughs> clear, are you, say your mortgage payment on two, $200,000 was uh, $1,500, yep. uh, are you out of pocket anything on this strategy in addition to the 1500 Well, yes. Now, you're going to... You're going to continue to make your mortgage payment on the first as before. But one thing to notice is more of your payment is going towards principal instead of interest, right? In our example, you started at 200000 and after the first time you got the HELOC, you went down to 150000 The $1,500 payment is now paying more principal when you owe 150 than you owe 200. Right. So, so but but just to be clear, it stays at 1500. Correct. You're not correct. You know, now you're not obligated for an $1800 payment. Correct. Correct. It's it's the same the mortgage is it's just you're paying it off faster, but the payment remains the same. Now meanwhile, you're going to have a payment on the HELOC side. Okay? But the way you pay it is by having cash flow in the amount. Now, HELOCs typically are interest only for the first 10 years. Okay, so by having, in our example, of uh, you have a $50,000 HELOC, you just wrote a $50,000 check, and I'm just making this up, say your salary is $3,000, you put that in there, and now you owe $47,000, and then during the month, the interest on the HELOC, whatever that may be, $300, comes out of your $3,000, right? So you are making a payment on the HELOC, you're making a payment on the first, but the, the difference is you're making progress on the principal at an accelerating rate compared to not making any progress for many, many years on the traditional first. Right, right, right. right. But to, so the the expense of that is an additional $300 though, but you're saying that outweighs the by the acceleration of the pay down of the first. Right, because you're making progress on the principal right. and the less principal you owe, the less interest you owe. So as you're on that fifty thousand dollar HELOC, as you're paying the principal down at an accelerating rate, you owe less and less interest. Right, right, right. So right. that's why your payment is going down every month because you owe less principal and less interest on it until you go to zero, and then you do it again. So the end result of this is literally life changing. You can pay off your mortgage in five or six years. There's a free website that people can go to to kind of model this for themselves, which is Truth in Equity dot com truth and you fill out a, a free what's called a personal profile 
and you put in all the numbers that affect your situation, your income, your expenses, the value of your house, your first mortgage, all these things. And it's going to come back and say, okay, based on the numbers you just gave us, it's going to take you 28 and a half years to pay off your mortgage. With the numbers you just gave us, it'll be 6.2 years to pay it off, whatever it may be. Done. Okay. That's and then they powerful. show you step by step how to do it. Because this is a bit of a mind bender. Okay. People are not, they think they're getting a great deal by getting a 30 year mortgage at 4% and keeping their money in the bank getting zero. Okay. The bank thinks they're getting a great deal because it's wonderful for the bank. But to, to reverse the tables is a bit of a mind bender for people. But the, the payoff is enormous. Imagine a couple who's 30 who just bought a house whose mortgage is paid off at 35 instead of 60. It's not going to make a great deal. And it's not only great in itself, but then once your mortgage is paid off, the money you would have been putting towards the mortgage, I want you to put towards investments to make your money work for you. Yeah, no, understood. And uh, Jordan, to be clear for people, I mean, HELOC money is accessible. It's not Correct. like you're tying it up uh, for, for mm -hmm. you know, you know, so it's going into this. And I think the concern would be, oh, you know, my paycheck is going towards my mortgage and I need to live. Right. So the, the HELOC is accessible. Live, but if you just put your paycheck in the checking account earning nothing, that same money could be pushing your principal down every day. Exactly. Now, that's that's very powerful. So is there any downside? I like to ask that question. Sure. Well, one downside is you get you gain equity in your house much faster, and it can be a, uh, what's the word? Temptation, I guess is the word, to go on vacation and do all kinds of wild and crazy stuff, and you, your mortgage is paid off in five years, and let's go do all kinds of spending that we don't really need to be doing. So if, if you're disciplined about it, it works, and I mean, I think the ultimate payoff for that is you pay your mortgage off. And then you, you make, keep making a mortgage payment to yourself in stocks and bonds and mutual funds and Bitcoin and whatever you like so that your money's growing for you. That's the ultimate payoff. Like, I'm very big on getting out of debt. And this is the, the biggest debt that most people have. So if you do it right, pay the thing off, and then invest what you would have been putting into your mortgage and yourself, that's the best of all possible outcomes. Jordan, so this is a, a interesting topic that we're going to get into now, and that's savings. Now, I know the average person in the U.S., uh, they came out with a statistic that said that mo most people can't even come up with $500 for right. a miscellaneous expense. But I would venture to say that the average person that's taking the time to listen to a podcast like this has some savings. They, they're, they're proactive with their investing and they got some money to actually save. Uh, so, you know, let's talk about that. The saver's dilemma, as you call it. The well, saver's dilemma is if you keep your money in the bank, you're pretty much going to get zero today. CDs, money market funds, savings accounts, checking accounts, zero, if not, you know, a little bit, half of 1%, something like that. The banks are getting away with murder. <laughs> the Fed Reserve has raised rates six times since December 2015, and so banks are raising what they're charging on loans, on credit cards, student loans, car loans, business loans, but they're not raising what they're paying on deposits, and they're going to keep it that way. The banks see people as a big lump. They'll just keep their money there. If they don't have to pay them anything and they can get away with it, just keep doing that. <laughs> it's great for the bank's profits, okay? So that cash is trash, I guess you might say. Mm -hmm. The alternative, the traditional alternative, is a long-term treasury bond or bond fund or something like that, where you're getting maybe 2.8, something like that. But I think interest rates are going to be rising further for a lot of different reasons, and therefore you're going to lose more in principal on the bonds than you're earning in interest. So that's the saver's dilemma. You don't want to keep it in cash where you earn nothing. You don't want to take the risk of long-term treasuries where you may earn 2.8, but you might lose 10 or 15% in principal as rates keep rising. So what I think the solution to the saver's dilemma is are what are called secured real estate funds, because that's a way of earning an 8% yield over a one-year time frame. You can take monthly checks if you like, or you can reinvest it and have it compound at 8%. Um, and the net asset value does not change. It stays at $10 a share. It doesn't go up, doesn't go down. Uh, there's a website for that, which is securedrealestatefunds.com. And basically what they're doing is lending money short-term, like over a year, to high quality commercial real estate projects all over the country, uh, apartment buildings, shopping centers, medical buildings, 
student housing, all kinds of different things that have a hard time getting loans from traditional banks. And they kind of, and these are smaller projects, half a million, million, something like that. Banks tend to like big projects, you know, 50, $100 million projects. So these kind of fall in between the cracks. And the people who are doing these funds have had many, many years of experience, over 30 years of experience doing this. And there's a way of getting 8% of your money instead of zero without having any market fluctuation. The stock market jumps all over the place. It doesn't affect you whatsoever. You can do this inside an IRA in what's called a self-directed IRA. You can do it outside. Uh, the minimum hold is one year. And after that, you can get your money whenever you like. And 8%. And there's no commissions involved. You give them... 50,000, 50,000 is going to get the 8%. Wow. And on top of that, Ken, you get a profit sharing distribution once a quarter. So when the buildings that they're lending to sell at a profit, the builder developer shares some of that profit with you, the shareholder. 80% of the profit goes to the shareholders. So you actually get a little bump on top of the 8%, maybe another one or two points on top of that. For 2017, the actual return of the fund was 8.7%. 8 from interest, 0.7 from the profit sharing. And as time goes on, and there are more pro more buildings coming to fruition with more profits to distribute, that profit sharing might be another one or two points on top of that. So there's a way of getting 8% in a 0% world without the risk of long treasuries, because I do think interest rates are going to go up further from here. Well, and not only long treasuries, but long real estate, because, you know, nobody knows what's going to happen exactly in the real estate market. And the risk of a 2008 financial crisis is, I mean, people just don't know if, if that's going to happen again. It's possible. And uh, but getting and exposing yourself for one year is a way to mitigate that risk. And, right. And, and, and to be a part and it's of a debt fund. It's a debt fund. No, they're lending to build the developers who are doing projects. It's not an equity fund where you're hoping to make money by the real estate appreciating. Okay. Right. The, the projects have what they call forced appreciation as part of them. They're doing something to the building to make it worth more. And that's why the builder developer has every reason to finish the project on time. I'll just give you a recent example if it helps, Ken. There's a guy that had a big house in Boulder, Colorado. And he'd been renting it to two students forever. He took a loan from the fund, couldn't get one from local bank, renovated the house, and a year later he had four apartments instead of two. So he added a lot of value to the existing property. So not only was his income doubled, but the value of the house was like 50% higher. So he's willing to pay 10% for a year because he couldn't get a loan from local bank to get, make that happen. That's what they call the forced appreciation strategy. Hmm. <laughs> Jordan Goodman, uh, wow, you're like a, a fountain of knowledge. Uh, I try to be. <laughs> <laughs> I'd love to help people. And, and I did get some emails from your folks last time. My website is moneyanswers.com. And I've got loads of YouTube videos and links and uh, newsletters and blogs. It's just like a whole community in the personal finance space. So the two websites we spoke about today, the truth in equity.com and the secured real estate funds.com are on there, but all kinds of other things to help people with their credit cards and insurance and all kinds of stuff. So I just love to help people with all these financial questions. Well, Jordan, uh, we're going to definitely have to do a follow up interview to discuss some of those other aspects. We're at the 30 minute mark here. And I mean, that's just a lot of information that we've, that I, I want people to go back and just, you know, look at their, mortgage situation and you know look at their savings uh but we are, we're definitely going to have to do a follow-up interview to talk Great. about some of these other things so i appreciate your time here at crush the street